A man was diving in the Poganitia Bay cave when something went horrifyingly wrong. This is his story. Off the coast of Croatia, in the Adriatic Sea, is a beautiful island known as the island of Sholta. The water surrounding the island is a bright turquoise that makes the island look like a tropical paradise. With a population of only 1,700 people, the coves around the island are perfect for swimming, fishing, and diving in the clear, warm water. There is, however, one area that the locals try to avoid, and that area is the Bay of Poganitia. In the native Croatian, the name Poganitia suggests something evil, and under the bay's surface is a cave that is known simply as the Bay of Poganitia Cave. In September 2002, a group was sailing in the Adriatic Sea and stopped in the bay to do some diving. On the night of Tuesday, September 10th, after having dinner and drinks, some of the members of the group decided to get into the water at around 9pm. The remaining individuals on the boat included three members of the crew, the captain who was asleep in his cabin, and a man known only as MK. Originally from Germany, MK was a 31-year-old naturalized citizen of Croatia and worked as a cook, and around 15 minutes after the group left, MK decided that he wanted to go diving as well, so he entered the water at around 9.15pm. For his dive, he was using a 15-liter air cylinder, pressurized to 200 bars. He was wearing a neoprene suit, and he had a dive computer on his wrist to give him all of the necessary information for a nice, safe dive. At the surface, the water in Poganitia Bay was a nice, comfortable 24 degrees Celsius, and MK then slowly made his way down to 9 meters to the cave entrance. The cave's entrance is a 2 meter wide funnel shape that gradually widens down to the first corridor. At around 15 meters, there is a split in the corridor that separates the cave into two galleries, one shallow and one deep. Although not shown on the map, each of these galleries has a labyrinth of tunnels that snake their way through the chambers, making it very easy to get lost, and the cave's interior, as with most caves, is lined with a fine silt. This silt is composed of dust and sand and typically lines the floor of these underwater caves, and divers have to be very careful not to disturb the silt, or it creates an opaque fog in the cave that brings visibility to essentially zero. Even with a high power flashlight, the way that the particles scatter the light can make it difficult for divers to even see their hands a foot in front of their face. Upon reaching the split in the cave, MK decided to enter the deep gallery, which goes all the way down to 57 meters, or around 200 feet. It also has at least one straight drop that allows you to go from 35 meters at the chamber's roof all the way to 50 meters in a straight line. Although MK was in good physical condition, his dive training was fairly basic, and he was also fairly inexperienced as a diver. Despite this, he went straight for the drop off and straight down to 50 meters in a smooth, dark descent. At the bottom of the pitch black chamber, the temperature drops a whole 10 degrees to only 14 Celsius or 57 Fahrenheit. After reaching 50 meters, MK started to ascend right away, first back up to the chamber's roof, then into the corridor leading out, and then he made a crucial mistake. MK made a wrong turn. Instead of going towards the exit tunnel, he turned and went into the shallow gallery. According to divers who know this cave well, when ascending from the deep gallery, the shallow gallery entrance looks like the exit funnel, even in good visibility. In poor visibility, like in a silted out cave, this mistake would be even easier to make. To make things worse, MK had had a few drinks with dinner, impairing his judgement as he entered an entirely unfamiliar section of the cave. This was now around 25 minutes into his dive, and with the air he had brought, he only had 35 minutes of air to ascend to the surface. This would also need to include some decompression stops along the way, or else he would get severe decompression sickness from ascending too quickly. MK must have been horrified as he made his way through the labyrinth of tunnels looking for the exit. On the surface, at 10.30, the rest of the group that had gone diving returned to the boat. Upon realizing that MK was missing, two of the divers went to the cave to search for him, and they searched for over an hour before returning to the boat at 11.41pm, but found no sign of MK anywhere. The group knew that unless MK had found an air pocket somewhere in the cave, based on the amount of air that he had taken, he would have already been completely out of air. So at 12.15am on Wednesday morning, they made an emergency call to the police in the nearby city of Split, Croatia. Later that morning, two police divers arrived and dove into the water to search the Poganitia Bay cave. First they swam to the entrance at 9 meters, then entered the dark tunnel. The cave widened for a bit until 15 meters when they reached the split between the two galleries. The police divers were also attached together by a line to prevent them from getting lost while searching, but at some point, one of the divers let go of the line and disappeared into the darkness. After his partner was nowhere to be found, the other police diver frantically searched for a way out as he ran out of air, and just before he was completely out of air, he managed to find the exit funnel and escape the abyss. In his panic and because of how low on air he was, he had to skip his decompression stops and developed severe decompression sickness as a result, and the police diver who had gotten lost would never be seen alive again. 
It's thought that he made the same mistake as MK and mistook the tunnel to the shallow gallery as the exit tunnel and then got lost in the labyrinth of tunnels. And although this was tragic, the search was still ongoing for MK. There were various sections in the cave where tiny fragments of light filtered through into the tunnels. And so it was conceivable that there was an air pocket that existed where MK could have found refuge. If he was still alive, this would mean that he would have been trapped for over 24 hours in the dark when divers re-entered the cave the following day to continue the search. The police diver who had gotten lost was found at 24 meters in the shallow gallery, and after searching the shallow gallery thoroughly, MK's body was still nowhere to be found. Divers then entered the deep gallery, and tragically, MK's body was found at 54 meters at the bottom of the cave. He was still in full gear, his diving mask was not on his head, his regular was out of his mouth, and he had a knife in his chest. While removing his gear, the knife was accidentally removed from his chest and his dive computer fell off, but they were recovered soon after and brought to the surface. Upon making this horrific discovery, the rescue had officially turned into a crime scene, and MK's death had to be treated as a possible homicide. So, all of the diving equipment and all the dive computers from all the members of the party were collected for forensic investigation. In addition, there was a suspicious reddish stain that was found on the deck of the boat. Police swabbed the area and immediately sent it off for analysis. Next, blood samples were taken from the entire crew and several knives were collected from the boat. Police then administered polygraph tests to all of the crew and all of them passed except two of the crew who were on the boat when MK reportedly went diving. Before testing, they were unaware that MK had been found and during the testing, the subjects reacted to the words knife and blood. After the tests, these two individuals were taken into custody but no formal charges were made just yet. The rest of the party was released but forbidden to leave the country as the investigation continued. And while police waited for the stain analysis results, all of the scuba gear was analyzed. First, they needed to make sure everything was working correctly and hadn't been tampered with or sabotaged. The dive computers were tested in a hyperbaric chamber and pressurized to a simulated depth that would exceed the depth at the bottom of the deep gallery. Analysis afterwards showed that each of the computers displayed the same dive profile, indicating they were in perfect working condition. And these profiles created by dive computers track the beginning of the dive, the maximum depth, the total decompression time, total ascent time, and total dive time. These can then be used to create a graphical representation of the dive. In addition, the computers had recorded 37 earlier dives, data that once stored cannot be deleted or changed, ensuring its accuracy. Next, the autopsy on MK's body found that he was in good physical condition before his death. He had a stab wound on the left side of his chest between his nipple and his sternum, and the wound was 11 centimeters deep and punctured his aorta. His lungs were found to have water in them, indicating that he had breathed water sometime around that he had died, which is typical of drowning. This means that it was likely that he died within two minutes or less after being stabbed. His blood alcohol was also 0.114. For reference, the legal limit for driving is typically 0.08, Based on all this information and the signs of drowning, MK was either stabbed and then thrown immediately into the water or stabbed under the water. The police then explored several possibilities about the circumstances of his death. The first possibility was that MK got into a fight with one or more people for some unknown reason. MK could have then been stabbed on the boat and then thrown into the water where he lived for a few minutes. This would explain the signs of drowning around the same time he was stabbed. Now, to understand this next part, you need to understand what the graphical representation of the dive computer ended up revealing. First, it showed MK entering the water and heading down to the cave's entrance in one smooth descent. From there, he traveled directly into the deep gallery and almost directly down to the 50 meter mark. After touching down, his dive computer registered him going up almost immediately once again. After this, the graph bounces up and down between the maximum depth of the shallow gallery and the ceiling of the shallow gallery indicating that he was moving around within its tunnels, seemingly looking for a way out. At some point, after the random depth changes, he ascended deeper once again to around 40 meters. He then rested at this depth for around 5 minutes before the graph shows a descent straight down to the bottom of the cave where his body was finally found. So if MK was stabbed on the boat and thrown in right away, his body would then need to be taken directly down to 50 meters, then taken immediately back up and wandering through the shallow section, then back to the deep section where it dropped to the bottom of the cave. Technically speaking, the killer could have done this using MK's air, saving his own for the return, but what he wouldn't have been able to do was surface at 10.30pm or earlier as was corroborated by the other members of the party unless he skipped his decompression stops and risked serious decompression sickness. Additionally, if MK had been stabbed in the boat, he wouldn't have been able to clear his ears or his sinuses which is typical during a descent to avoid injury. During the autopsy, this would have manifested as ruptured eardrums and blood in the middle ear canal which was not found. 
If the killer was an experienced diver, they would be aware of this fact, but still might have done it anyway in an attempt to hide the body. But because of the timeline and how demanding this would have been, this scenario was ruled out. The next scenario considered was one of premeditated murder. The killer could have tied a rope to the dive computer, added a weight to it, brought it to the entrance of the cave, and then dropped it down and simply pulled it up and down to simulate the depth achieved and cover the tracks. The body could have then been placed at the bottom at any point in time, and the dive computer would have a falsified version of the events. This scenario, again, was ruled out because of how the cave is shaped. It's highly unlikely that the depth recorded by the dive computer could be achieved without catching on a rock or a ledge, which would have made the initial smooth ascent down to 50 meters almost impossible. The final possibility that was examined was one where MK did actually encounter the initial two divers who had gone to search for him shortly after they got back from their dive. It's possible that one of them found MK resting under the roof of the deep gallery when MK was already almost out of air. Upon noticing the rescuer, MK could have panicked and attacked him to try to save himself at all costs. And at some point during this attack, MK could have pulled a knife that the rescuer then used to stab MK in defense. After that, the rescuer could have ascended and called the police and given the timeline of events. However, the dive computer showed that the rescue started at 1046. This was already roughly 45 minutes after MK's dive computer had flatlined at the bottom of the deep gallery. On top of the fact that the other rescuer didn't descend to more than 9 meters, ruling him out as a suspect. So, with all of these other possibilities ruled out, a final situation was considered. This is that sequence of events. On Tuesday, September 10th, 2002, MK entered the water at 9.15 shortly after the other party of divers. He then descended down to 9 meters to the cave entrance. After entering the cave, he went directly down the first corridor to reach the split-off between the deep and shallow galleries. He chose the path to the deep gallery and swam down that corridor and then almost directly down to 50 meters deep in one smooth descent. Upon touching down, MK went directly back up, possibly to exit the cave, but he seems to have mistaken the entrance to the shallow gallery for the exit. This was either due to their close appearance or due to silty conditions, reducing visibility in the cave. He then swam around the labyrinth of tunnels in the shallow gallery for almost 30 minutes, probably panicking, knowing he was lost, before finding the corridor to the deep gallery once again. And upon entering the deep gallery, he was already almost out of air and knew that he would soon drown. He seems to have looked around the deep section for a minute or two before resting against the ceiling, contemplating what to do next. He might have been panicking, or he might have been calm, but since no one is alive to tell the story, we'll never know exactly. What we do know is that MK was almost certainly afraid of drowning because it seems that he made the horrifying decision to stab himself in the chest to avoid it. It's unclear whether or not MK was conscious in his last moments, but he seems to have inhaled water at some point anyway, making his last moments even more tragic. It's also unclear how much alcohol played a role in impairing his judgment, or how much he was affected by nitrogen narcosis in his final minutes. But after stabbing himself, MK slowly drifted down to the deepest part of the cave in complete darkness, where his body was ultimately found at 54 meters. This conclusion was initially rejected by Croatian military divers, who rejected suicide as a possibility. But then the results of the stain further confirmed the conclusions of the forensic team, when it was found to have just been some paint that had stained the deck. In addition, the forensic team reasoned that if it had been a murder, there would have been many easier ways to kill someone during a dive. First, MK could have been easily approached from behind, his regulator could have been pulled out, and he would have drowned just the same. The purge button on his equipment could have been pushed, emptying his air cylinder, once again leading to his drowning. And finally, to explain MK's actions in his final moments, there are plenty of cases observed where victims choose suicide over a perceived worse way of dying. For example, in the case of a burning building, victims frequently choose to jump to their death instead of what is perceived as a much worse fate which is burning to death, and so ultimately, MK's death was ruled a suicide. Contributing to his death was his inexperience, the alcohol in his system, and the difficulty of the cave he was diving in. With all that being said, considering that one of the police divers even died while attempting a rescue, it's clear that the Poganizia Bay cave lines up with the reputation given to it by locals. If you made it this far, I just want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out the other videos in the series. And hopefully, I will see you in the next one.